unmute. So. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start. All right. Um, hi, I'm Laurie Garner with Career Services with Tarleton State University, and we're going to be having a live event tonight. It is uh, our newest um, diversity in action panel. We This is our very first one, and it's LGBTQ plus workplace equality. We're really glad everyone's going to join us. We're going to give people just a few minutes to jump in, jump on before we get started. But what I'd like to remind you is we will be taking questions tonight. So we would love for you to ask questions in the chat and then we will ask them of our panel. And we have a wonderful panel here tonight composed of faculty, staff and employer and an employer, one of our employer partners. So we're going to be introducing everybody in just a minute. So just a reminder to get your questions ready, put them in the chat so that we can answer them. We're very, very excited you joined us. And again, this is our diversity in action panel from Career Services with Charlton State University, LGBTQ plus workplace equality. It's our first in a series of panels that we will be discussing DEI initiatives and how it um, relates to the workplace and you as a student finding a job or a grad, um, different aspects of that, or those of you that are in human resources, sociology, psychology, counseling, anyone, um, diversity, equality, and in inclusion is a very hot topic in all of our employers these days. So um, we are, are very, very excited um, to present this. So I'm going to kick it off and introduce myself, and then the rest of the panel will introduce themselves. And remember, submit those questions. So my name, again, is Laurie Garner, and I am a career development coordinator with Career Services. I office out of the Fort Worth office and I, um, my specialty is working with our non-traditional students on the Fort Worth, Midlothian, Waco campuses and RELIS. I have a degree from the University of North Texas and a background um, of years of experience working with youth development and nonprofit management. So um, I would really love for all of our panelists to introduce themselves, but first um, I'm going to have Alana Hefner, our director, introduce herself. Hi, my name is Alana Hefner, and as she said, I'm the director of career services, and I've been with the university for 14 years. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, and I received my master's degree in guidance and counseling with a licensed professional counselor, so I have an LPC. And I got both of my degrees from Charleston State. Um, beyond that, I've also not only working with the university, outside of the university, I've worked in child advocacy and the mental health fields, um, all very relevant to our topic. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Beck Muncy. I'm a, the department head and an associate professor here at Charleston State University in the counseling department. Um, I've been at Tarleton since 2013, um, and I received my bachelor's in psychology from Baylor University, Sikkim Bears, um, and then I went on and received my master's in community counseling and my doctorate in counselor education and supervision at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. 
Um, I, besides being a professor here at Tarleton, I also have a, a small private practice uh, where I primarily see um, clients from the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and I'm a transgender um, faculty member as well. Fantastic. Turbo? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Tibur Selinse. I go by Turbo. My pronouns are he, him, el, and I serve as a director for the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and International Programs. I arrived to United States in 2002 from a small town in Mexico, and uh, I graduated from Tarleton State University in 2012. After that, I went to Texas State University, Bobcats, and I got my master's degree in Spanish philology. And then um, working there, I worked for um, a TRIO program, and I discovered my passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion after um, serving in the Committee for Equality University. And I was able to align my interests from my master's degree in uh, the practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So anything related to language, um, gender politics uh, is something that's very interesting to me, and I am excited to be here. So. Thank you so much. Jade? Okay, well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jade Veit, and I am currently our group talent manager at Enterprise Holdings um, here in North Texas. So we operate Enterprise Rent-A-Car, National Car Rental, and Alamo Rent-A-Car, as well as a truck division and a car sales division. Um, I currently support about 1,200 plus employees in North Texas, everything from our recruiting, staffing, and training initiatives. Um, but also, that's my day job. My side job at Enterprise is supporting our and helping to lead all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives here in North Texas. I also sat in our company's national diversity team, um, and it is my true passion for creating equitable opportunities for everyone on our team um, and hiring the best and most talented, regardless of who they are and where they come from. So, so honored to be uh, representing our company today here with all of you. Excellent. And Janice. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Janice Gooden. Um, I'm currently a vehicle repair field supervisor um, for the Dallas region with Enterprise Holdings. Um, I oversee roughly 50 repair facilities by conducting physical inspections and electronic audits to monitor shop performance to ensure safety and efficiency, um, as well as the timeliness of our repairs um, to the repairs of our fleet. Um, in addition, I work closely with our employees in the branches um, to educate and train them on vehicle maintenance, safety, and recall standards. So um, my, my, my primary focus is to make sure that our fleet is safe and um, good for our customers to rent. Um, I began my enterprise career in West Texas, specifically Amarillo, so um, a little bit smaller of a location um, a little over seven years ago. I've been here in DFW for the last five years. Um, like Jade, I've also spent a big part of my career um, working with our diversity and inclusion efforts, um, and I'm very excited to be here as well. Thank you, everyone. We're very excited that this panel um, could join us, and today we'll be discussing LBGTQ work and plus workplace equality, and we have such knowledgeable panelists. Uh, DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion are very hot topics in, the, in employment right now, and we're hoping to get your mind turning and help you prepare for a position in the workplace as you graduate from Tarleton. So get your questions ready and, and submit them on the chat. But first, we're going to hear a little bit from Turbo Lentz from the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and International Programs here at Tarleton. Thank you so much. So today's when I was asked to participate in this panel, I was pretty excited. And a couple of things that I want to frame our conversation today is in two things. One is for our students, uh, for those members who identify as members of LGBTQ plus community. And what are some of the kind reminders of some of the hardships and struggles that they may be facing as they go into the workplace, um, looking for internships or beginning interviewing in which uh, entities they want to be associated with, um, whether it's an enterprise company, whether it's whatever it is, to I want them to be very mindful of um, a couple of things that they may be 
uh, facing. And then the second part is for those uh, faculty, staff, uh, career service advisors who may be joining us today, is also to begin learning what are some of those hardships. So one of the things that I learned uh, in working in an office of diversity and inclusion is that there is always, always in this world, because we live in a world uh, dominated by power and dynamics, is that there is always lack of diversity um, and exclusion, right? So that's why there's an office to work with that. So that is always the lens that I always look at. It's like, where are our specific populations uh, being excluded from? At the moment that you hold a marginalized identity, a lot of the agency is removed. So I really want you to pay attention closely as one, if you're that person, what you need to be looking for. And if you're the person with uh, authority, power, how can you be scanning for inequities? So I want you to keep that in mind. That's the framework that I wanted to place. The first thing is that for all of you folks who identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community is that you need to, deter like, to determine if a future job or internship will be welcoming to uh, lay, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students. Um, sometimes you must do a little bit of detective work, right? So that's period, point blank. You always have to look at, is this going to be, is this internship or this professional opportunity offered in a metropolitan area? Is it going to be in a rural area? Is it going to have access? Is it going to have representation? So always do, I really want you to begin with doing a background check on the company for which you will be um, seeking to be part of. So uh, network and seek reliable information about the climate and politics of the potential site. That is so important. Um, there is great uh, resources out there. I'm gonna be trying to put them in the chat for you to add them to your list as you're, uh, as you're searching for jobs and opportunities. Um, but this is information where you can get uh, information about the training sites, fellowships and jobs from LGBTQ plus grad students from all over the country. Um, additionally, you don't have, it's really hard to find that information. So always go um, at the national level. The Human Rights Campaign publishes an annual best, uh, best places to work list. And also Campus Pride has developed an assessment tool for evaluating LGBTQ plus climates in higher education. If you're looking for that post-grad education, if you're gonna get your doctoral program, whatever it is, anything that advances you professionally. And the nonprofit organization Out and Equal is devoted exclusively to LGBTQ plus workplace issues. Um, and those are some really valuable information. So you just began doing like the background work, right? Then when you have identified potential like, you know, partners that you want to be associated with, then, then you begin checking out the official policies. So once you are engaged in that conversation that you are gonna interview, that you are being uh, a viable candidate, um, if you're applying for a position, um, get a copy of, of its non-discriminatory employment policy. That's very heavy language right there. But I want you to be empowered to be able to ask for that up front. Like, what does that look like? Um, and see if it specifically protects employees on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Also, check out the policies uh, related to lifestyle factors such as uh, whether uh, same-sex partners uh, can live, uh, if it's one of those fancy uh, internship sites where you know, they provide the housing, like, well, like what does that look like? Try to get a feel for that on what is explicitly provided and out there for the world to see in their website, in their uh, employee services or human talent recruitment uh, sites, because they will have that. And then similarly, obtain a copy of the, uh, of the policy to, to see what are some of the things that they are talking about. So if it's including employment, non-discrimination, domestic partnership, uh, healthcare benefits, start scouting for that language because it's going to be so important. Start looking for where are some of those uh, potentially exclusionary practices that you may want to avoid. Um, but if necessary, seek out the company's diversity or equal employment opportunity officer, right? So it's really important. And ask about anything that isn't clear. And then, so you went from doing the background, moving into like what you can request, and now you're at the interview phase, right? So this is the most, you know, potentially difficult one, but you have to finesse that interview. So when interviewing for a job or internship, strike a balance between timing and tact and being true to yourself, right? So for instance, you can begin that soft conversation with just a random question of like, hey, what is the culture regarding to diversity and inclusion in the company, 
And that normally is like, you know, people, you're going to get a feel for that. So whether it's like, oh, definitely. And then they just, it's like a, a word vomit on all the initiatives, all the strategies, all the specific targeted uh, initiatives in advancement for minoritized identities. And that, that, that should be a pretty good signal on how you can then advance that conversation. Like, okay, cool. In terms of LGBTQ plus um, topics and then advance your question, right? So, but it's, it's a time to really begin finessing that. It is sadly um, a reality where being that fierce advocate may be uh, a problem and may potentially consider you a viable or unviable candidate. So always try that finessing. And just um, as you're focusing on that, I want you to think about there's uh, the LGBT Pro uh, Professional and Student Association. Um, you have from the Human Rights Campaign and then the Corporate uh, Equality Index that is 2021. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste it in the chat in a little bit. And so that's only one part, right? So I want you to also think about like what happens when you do after work? What are some of those potential barriers when you have to move out of state and you have to become um, acquainted with the policies regarding non-discrimination for LGBTQ+, like re the reality is that we don't have a large federal <laughs> law that prevents that, but there may be some states that will be a little bit better or a little bit more friendlier. So I will go ahead and uh, talk about very, very briefly, I may be running out of time. Uh, when it comes to housing, there's a lot of resources that I want to give you, but basically I want you to just understand like, what are some of those benefits and uh, the American Civil Liberty Union has a specific list of uh, quite, uh, resources that can help you if you feel that you uh, are being discriminated. So I'm gonna go ahead and post all those resources and also the link that tells you which states and what policies they have in terms of protection against discrimination. So that's all I have as of right now, but I'm gonna be here available for questions. Thank you so much, Turbo. That was fantastic. And so Turbo will give us links to all of those things and, and make sure, you know, if you have a question for Turbo, put it in the chat. Um, he's here as a resource and, and a resource for all of our Tarleton students and alumni on the campus. Um, all right, so our next speaker is Dr. Beck Muncy, who is the department head and associate professor for the Department of Counseling. Dr. Muncy offices on the Fort Worth campus. And I want to say that one of the most impressive things about being at Tarleton is the relationship that students can build with faculty. And Dr. Muncy is just a great example of that. So Dr. Muncy, you're on. Well, thank you for that um, intro. So, um, so the talking points I want to talk about tonight are, you know, as a member of the LGBTQ uh, plus community, there are some things that, you know, I need to think about every time I go into a new job situation. One is, you know, do I want to disclose this information to my employer or my employee, people, my colleagues that I'm working with? Because it's my right not to disclose that information, especially if I do not feel safe or I'm not in a place in my life to be out and open. Um, and so those, that's a personal choice that we all make um, that are members of this community. And then the second part of that is, if I do want to disclose, uh, how do I want to represent my identity and what of my identity do I want to disclose? So I just because I come out to somebody at work doesn't mean I have to come out to everybody at work. It doesn't mean that I have to act a certain way once I come out. Um, and so I think it's really important that we, you know, I may go to a supervisor. Um, in my case, I went to employee services, which is our HR, and had a conversation with them about my rights um, when I did come out as trans at Tarleton. Um, and then I went to my supervisor to really explain what was going on so that they could help support me as I started coming out and transitioning at work. Um, some other things that we want to look for is, you know, Turbo really did a, a wonderful job talking about you know, searching for a friendly employer. And so um, for me, you know, language is so important. Um, and so it really is about looking at, in a, at um, you know, a future job about what, what is their, what are their policies? What, you know, what are people, um, what's the language are they using and even in their application? What, what language are they using, you know, in their job description? That's really important for me and, are they recognizing gender neutral pronouns? Are they using very binary language? Is a very indication to me about some of their, maybe some of their overall environment of that 
um, agency or employer. And so the other thing I like to look at is who are they donating to? So that really tells me too what their, you know, viewpoints, maybe some of their political parties that they um, donate to. Um, and like Tur Turbo said, I like to look at HRS, the human rights campaign ratings and seeing, you know, um, and uh, the other thing is looking at health benefits for me, um, you know, as a someone who's gone through medical transition and is still a part of medical transition, I need to make sure that some of my medical transitional stuff is going to be covered. Or am I going to have to pay for it out of pocket, even though I'm fully employed? So those things are some things I take in consideration. Um, so um, the other, another thing I want to talk about is just looking at advocacy for self in the workplace. And this is a hard thing. Um, unfortunately, those in the community um, definitely know that we have to be our biggest advocates. And sometimes, um, you know, I need to, I have to speak up when I hear injustice in the workplace. Um, when people are using the wrong pronouns for me, and, and that becomes uncomfortable at times, but if I don't say something, a lot of times pe other people won't say anything, and so a lot of times that um, is something that I have to, to work on, but I think for me, the biggest thing that's really helped with my advocacy is building relationships at my job, so I have a lot of colleagues who I consider friends, and so you know, a lot of times I'll go to them and say, hey, can you help me with this? You know, if you hear this or you hear somebody saying something incorrectly, do you can you you know correct them for me? Um, and so having having relationships, and it also makes it easier to come to someone and say, "Hey, I noticed that you know you keep talking in an incorrect way about me, and, and I just want to have a conversation so that we you know it's out in the open and that we can move forward." Um, and then. Um, Sometimes it's really hard, I think, being a part of the community. Um, I know a lot of people tell me I'm the first trans person they've met. And so I'm very visible on campus. Um, I'm very out on campus. And so sometimes I feel like I have to be a model. And so like all, if they don't have any other representation besides what they get on the me through media resources, that a lot of times there's this additional pressure that I have to be on the top of my game all the time. Um, and so that sometimes happens to those of us um, who are part of the community because we are trying to represent our community well. And that does sometimes put some additional pressures on us. Um, and the last thing I would like to talk about before I turn it over um, is, you know, for me, looking at feeling safe at a workplace is one, I want to be able to be authentic. So I want to be able to have conversations about my family and who I am and to be seen um, in my case, as a male. And so being able to do that and being able to navigate in my work environment as that is very affirming for me and makes me feel safe. Um, and um, also, you know, being able to have the safe space to talk about, you know, um, inclusive language, to be able to say, hey, our policy is very binary. Let's think about changing to a gender neutral pronoun. And I'm just using, uh, you know, one example, um, and, and also being able to have a seat at the table, being able to be a part of conversations and policy changes and curriculum in the case of education, being a part of those conversations really make me feel like I'm safe and that I'm also seen at, um, at a job. Thank you so much, Dr. Muncy. You know, um, your, your experience is really valued here at Tarleton and we appreciate your openness and your honesty and just all the things you've talked about helps all of us, you know, to be better employees and, and better friends and, and at any situation, you know, whether it's at Tarleton or another company that we, any of us may join in the future. So don't forget those questions in the chat. Um, one of the most valued aspects at career of career services at Tarleton is the relationship that we have with our employer partners. Enterprise has been an outstanding partner to us. They are always participating and always lending their expertise, their time, their treasure, their talent to us. Today, we have two representatives, Jade Veit, who's the Group Talent Development Manager and Group Diversity Advisor, and Janice Gooden, who is the Vehicle Repair Field Supervisor. So I'm gonna kick it off to them. I think they've got a great um, 
part of as our employer representatives. Well, thank you so much, Lori. We really just, you know, not just on behalf of Janice, but on behalf of our entire North Texas team, we just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, you know, first, we, we treasure every minute we get to spend with the Tarleton community, but also it was a great honor for you to ask us to be part of this, you know, inaugural event. Um, we, we really greatly value your partnership as well. We truly, truly value the students that we find on Tarleton's campus um, and truly because they are so diverse. You know, we, we get such a diverse pool of employees that come from Tarleton. And so we really feel honored that you felt safe enough to invite us to be part of this panel. And, you know, Janice and I are gonna kind of split up a little, some topics we wanna cover for you. Um, I'm going to be kind of speaking from that um, diversity and um, training and kind of corporate benefits standpoint. And then Janice is going to speak as an employee who's been personally impacted and who personally impacts so many on our team. So first, I just kind of wanted to talk about how this special population of employees um, is, is appreciated at Enterprise specifically. So we feel that our LGBTQ plus community um, of employees really offer a unique perspective, not only on the business and on the community in which we do business, but also the way that we work, the way we attack our daily activities um, and the advancement of leadership um, development, and then just internally our DEI initiatives. Um, they really are at the core of what we do. You know, and I think both Turbo and, and Beck both spoke about how it's so important to find an organization that you personally can align with. And, um, you know, we hope that if you spend a few minutes on our website, you will feel that enterprise is absolutely inclusive and uh, open arms. And one of our founding values is that our doors are open. And that specifically speaks to um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion organization. So, Every employee brings personal and professional experience with them when they join our team, and that's what makes us so strong, and we feel like that's what makes us so unique, not only in the rental car industry, but in the travel industry as a whole. So we truly feel that um, your community is really a beacon for inclusion and really sets the stage for how lots of other organizations and lots of other segments of diversity should be reacting from an inclusion standpoint. So I wanted to kind of cover a few policies specific to enterprise. Um, you know, we at enterprise feel like we want everyone to bring their whole self to work. Um, every, every bit of you, um, who you are. And we really try to instill upon our management team that as you're learning how to engage employees as a leader at Enterprise, it is extremely important to care about your employees, both professionally and personally. Um, so everything that they are at home, we need to care about as much as they are at work. You know, and I think that Turbo brought up some good points and Dr. Muncie brought up some good points about, you know, when the time is right for you to feel comfortable. Um, but we truly, truly want to know our employees. Um, when we hire someone into our management training program, we have every intention of you retiring with us. So, um, you know, for us, it's, it's a marriage. We're not just dating when we start, when we um, offer you a position. So we really want to get to know the whole self of our employees. Um, and from an internal promotional standpoint, you know, at Enterprise, we promote entirely from within. So nearly 99.999% of our organization, other than a few very high level attorneys, um, everybody in our organization started as a management trainee, just like Janice and myself. And we all started ground floor, you know, either straight out of college or with a few years of experience, um, but started working side by side in the branches, learning the business from the ground up. And then based on our performance, we had the opportunity to advance. And, you know, Janice will kind of speak to our culture and things that have made us stay um, for as long as we've have. I've been with the company for 16 years. 
But what I think is really unique about enterprise is since we have a promote from within culture, it is entirely important. It is essential that that internal promotional process is fair and equitable. And so that is part of my job is to make sure that our internal interview process, um, that we create opportunities equally for all of our employees, that they're performance-based, and that we have an equal and fair interview process where everyone's asked the same questions and their performance is all ranked equally, and then that everyone is given transparent feedback after an interview regarding why they were or were not selected. And I, I think we're pretty unique in that space. Um, we do a really good job. We now provide verbal and written feedback to every interview um, that we have. And we have thousands and thousands just in North Texas alone every year. Um, we have over had over 1,300 promotions in North Texas in the last 12 months. So um, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of heavy lifting for our hiring managers, but it is essential so that all of our employees feel that they have that equitable opportunity to advance and grow within the company. Um, so one other thing I wanted to mention, then I'll flip it over to Janice, is the evolution of policies. So we've already kind of touched upon it, but you know, with enterprise very early on when there was only a few states that were granting same-sex marriages, enterprise immediately said, if you are married in your state, you qualify for benefits. Um, and I, that was early in my years with the company. And I thought it was incredible. You know, we're, we're a Midwestern family owned organization. And so we tend to be on the conservative side of things. But from that standpoint, from treating our employees with respect and giving them what they need to be successful, um, we've always been at the forefront. So um, we did that very, very early on. I remember it almost being taboo. <laughs> um, and, but our, our Taylor family who owned our company said, no, absolutely not. If you have a spouse, we don't care who they are. They are granted the benefits. Same thing with adoption policies um, and IVF policies, which we've kind of been a leader in that space for same-sex marriages. Um, and so I'm really proud of that. And then a recent move that we made is, again, we were a conservative company. All of our gentlemen wore a, a shirt, a white dress shirt and a tie until 2017. Um, and now the granddaughter of our founder, Jack Taylor, his granddaughter is Chrissy Taylor. She now runs our organization. And um, she had a cutting of the tie ceremony and said, we are not going to make people wear ties to work anymore. Um, we want people to come to work in what they can be comfortable in. And I think that was really a movement to move into a more gender neutral dress policy. Um, and that was a huge move for us. So now, whatever you're comfortable in, as long as it's business, business casual, um, any dress shirt, it doesn't, you don't have to have a tie, you don't have to be in a dress in, or a suit, um, you know, but however you're comfortable. And again, you can be your whole self at work. Um, so I thought that was a really big movement. And then just recently, um, obviously, there was a lot of racial unjust um, and, and things going on in our world last year. And so our company immediately pivoted. We had never had a chief diversity officer, but we just named one um, in the last six months. So his name's Aaron Braddock. And he is now leading all diversity and equity inclusion initiatives for our company, um, which was a really historical moment for us. And he is doing all the things that we've needed to do um, and all the things that some of us had never thought needed to be done. So we're really excited about that new chapter. So I'm gonna flip it over to Janice now and she's gonna give you some, um, some of her thoughts and feedback about working for us. Thanks, Jade. Um, so really, like, what is great? So um, I am, I, I advise lesbians. One of the great things is that all the things that you just heard Jade talk about, you know, we all get the spill, we all get the spill and come work for my company because of this, that, and the other. But I 100% and would not deny it ever, like, everything you hear Jade saying is 100% true. Um, for if you guys remember at the beginning I said I started my career in West Texas in Amarillo and if you know anything about Amarillo um it's not tiny but it's but it's definitely town feelish um and it's very old school and so when I started the company there obviously I, knew, I had a lot of friends there and things like that and um you know I started with the company and and, and to Turbo's and, and Dr. Muncie's point like definitely if you can research and do the research about what company you're going to work for do so um, at the time, I really didn't. Um, I had heard about Enterprise. I wanted to work for Enterprise, and I started working. Um, I typically dress a little more 
male, I guess you can say. Um, I don't put on dresses or skirts or makeup or anything like that. Um, and so I always have had this thing where, you know, I go to work. A couple of my friends, they were like, what are you doing? And so um, I was like, well, you know, it's Amarillo and whatever. But um, the company has always been great. So when I transferred over here to DFW, um, just being in a bigger area and, and point, you know, depending on, depending on so comfortable or not comfortable, and you have to figure that out. But when I got here, um, I saw several um, employees, um, and I'm going to speak specifically female, that, you know, wore more of the male dress code. So like Jade said, we kind of had more of that conservative guys were in ties and suits and girls were, you know, in their female oriented clothes. And so I started seeing females and they were wearing like kind of more of the male suits. And I was like, okay. I kind of jumped out there too and did the same thing. And like, talk about a breath of fresh air because like now I really just got to be like, was like, hey, dressed like this last week and now you know um since I've been here in DFW I've promoted three times I believe um and at each of those interviews we have worn what I was comfortable with which is typically in my because I am not a tie to a person um so the work is nice in a way that made it better better but I don't want to come in and things like that and you know nobody even bats an eyelash which is great um kind of talking about the culture of enterprise you know like one of the great things is like I go to work every day and everybody probably just about everybody knows my wife's name knows about my stuff and think about it because I can go to work and and talk about my life and not have to change a pronoun and you know pretend that it's a he or anything like that say my wife I can say April um anything like that you know um I got I got married this last summer and you know I talked to a lot of the leadership about it and I got a lot of congratulations and everybody was so excited so um definitely important you know in my office you can go in you see pictures of my wife you see pictures of my kids my dogs um and and it's great because people will even ask you about it you know like people don't just like accept it and just be quiet and ignore it like they actually you know Jade I remember the first time I we had talked and she actually like weeks later remembered April's name which is my wife and I and like that's a little thing but to me I was just like she remembered her name I addressed her by name so such little things but definitely important and I'm sure you understand that and as you go out into the workforce you know those are things that are important um you know you want to be yourself um so I definitely encourage you but like I said you know Jade definitely hit it on the head and Enterprise is definitely one of those companies that, you know, you can be yourself. Um, medical, like she said, you know, um, this year, I just recently added my wife to my insurance. And I love that because, you know, it, it's nice that we have the same insurance. And if something happens, I know that she can be there. I know that the company will call her if need be, um, all of those good things. So it's definitely something I I about working here. Um, and then I love, like, we get involved in the Dallas Pride Parade. Of course, we didn't last year because it didn't even happen. But every year, I've been a part of that since I've been here in DFW, which has been awesome because we get to go out there and be loud and proud and represent the company that we work for. And it's great because when we're going down the parade route, everybody's like, oh, my gosh, it's Just overall, it's been great. So I, if I can leave you with anything, be who you are. Do your research like everyone else has said. And make sure that you work for a company that, you know, is going to let you be you. Yes. Thank you, Janice. I have a few more things to add on. Um, just like Janice said, you know, we, we try to be very, very welcoming and accepting and of all, all makes and models is how we like to say it. Um, because obviously we're a car company. <laughs> Hopefully you got my um, joke. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, also we have a ton of training that we do, um, you know, obviously because we're a leadership development company, that's what we tend to say is we're a leadership development company and renting cars is kind of our side gig. Um, but as we're bringing managers up in our organization, it is essential, not just on the hiring front for us to be welcoming of all kinds to come into the company, but if myself and my TA managers like Luella, who helps support Tarleton, if we are on the forefront of the organization bringing diverse talent into the company, 
but then we turn our talent over to a manager who's not accepting or not capable of having those welcoming, um, difficult conversations at times, then we're doing our employees a disservice. So it's just as important for us to have ongoing difficult conversations and to really challenge our managers to continue to grow and evolve and be as equitable as possible on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we have what we call open minds, open doors. We call OMOD training. It starts day one in our new hire training and it continues forever. Um, so we are constantly growing and evolving. We are always adding content to it. But, you know, as a new hire, we were talking about how we need to be equitable with the services we offer to our customers. And we have to be welcoming of everyone in the community and what some of those, you know, all the racial divide or the gender divide could mean in a conversation with the customer. And then once someone becomes a manager, it's the customer perspective and your employee perspective and your manager perspective and your co-manager perspective and being able to to be as welcoming and equitable as we possibly can be um, so we continue that training forever like I said our general manager just celebrated his 30th anniversary with the company last year and he's going through another training this month so it never ever stops it's that important to us um, so I wanted to mention that I also wanted to mention that you know, we do employee spotlights. We actually just had Janice in one of our spotlights during our Black History Month, but we do it throughout the year for all different um, <laughs> for all different months. We're always trying to celebrate our employees, you know, and just like she mentioned, you know, Pride Month is huge for us. Um, and I don't know if we'll get to that later on, um, if it'll come up in the chat, but, you know, when you are out there and you're researching organizations, a really great kind of sneaky, kind of not sneaky way to do your research is to flip back to June of last year um, and see if the organization on social media or their website did anything during Pride Month, um, because that will kind of give you a glimpse into what their level of um, openness is in that space. Um, and I absolutely loved, I think it was either Turbo or Dr. Muncy mentioned asking those strategic questions in an interview process and just saying, oh, tell me about your diversity and equity and inclusion efforts. And then they'll tell you, um, and then you can respond um, and that can kind of open the conversation. So I did wanna point that out. We also have a lot of employee resource groups um, and we are looking to grow that space as well. I think most companies are these days, but those are really important. And those are some keywords you can ask for during an interview process is tell me about your employee resource groups. Um, and then also, you know, we do a regular employee opinion survey. It's called our Your Voice Counts, um, and that's an opportunity for every employee to voice, you know, things we're doing great and opportunities for, for advancing different causes. And so we do that on an annual basis to gather feedback from our employees, and a lot of companies do that as well, but you can always ask that question during an interview process. So Janice, anything I left out, ma'am? Not really, you covered most of it, just kind of touching base on, you know, how you feel safe emotionally and physically um, in a workplace. Um, you know, Jade touched on it quite a bit earlier. Um, we have eight founding, value, eight founding values with our company and one of them is our doors are always open. Um, and again, I, I, I wanna say, you know, like you hear things and they say, oh yeah, you know, I mean, how many times you've heard, yeah, my door is always open, but every time you go to it, it's closed not in our environment. I mean, like I can, I can walk into Jade's office pretty much anytime I want to, um, obviously respectfully if she's not on a call or in a meeting or something like that, but, and not just Jade, she mentioned um, our group manager, Brent Russell, um, I can walk into his office at any time and, and sit down and have a conversation with him. And so, um, you know, anytime you're struggling with something, if you feel like someone, um, you know, did something that, you know, hurt your feelings or made you feel uncomfortable, um, there is somebody that's always there. And, you know, just like anybody else, we have a direct line and you can go through the channels. And if for some reason that channel doesn't feel comfortable to you, um, you can jump right on up and, and literally go into somebody's office and say, hey, I need help with this or, you know, something happened. And I have, I've never known any of my coworkers or myself to ever address something and it not get addressed immediately. So, that's been a huge perk with enterprise. So definitely find the company, you know, like they said, find the company that not only talks to talk, but walks the walk. Yes. One last thing I want to add. I know we're- Go ahead. It's all right. Go ahead. 
Um, but I did just want to say that, you know, for a lot of organizations who maybe don't have the representation in maybe upper level leadership yet, because we're a lot of us are still in progress and working to get there. Um, it's really important to find an organization that has allies, right? And I'm sure, you know, you talk about that in this space a lot. And in this community, it's so important that even though I have a husband and kids at home, I care just as much about you as I do about anyone else. And, um, you know, to find an organization that has an LGBTQIA and allies um, group is really, really important because it, it spreads the, the breadth of support out from just the immediate folks who might, um, might you know, feel safe in that space to, to be allies and others who are there to support you and offer that that added level of um, care and concern. That is a, a great point. And um, I know both Alana and I serve as allies for Tarleton. So we do have that program with employees. And, um, you know, it, it, these are just some great hints, even for us as employees of, of Tarleton, we need to start looking at our website and see if we're doing all the right things as well. But thank you so much. Enterprise has been such a great company to, to um, partner with us. Just like I had said, it's all been very enlightening and we just appreciate your help and willingness to share your company philosophy with us. I'd just like to remind everyone um, to submit those questions because now we're going to our um, part two of our uh, event tonight and that is questions from the audience and we would absolutely love to hear from you. Alana Hefner, our Director of Career Services, is going to be our Vanna tonight and give all the questions out to the panelists. So I'm going to turn it over to Alana. I get to use jazz hands. Woo! All right. Well, uh, we've had a couple of questions come in and I think um, as one came in, uh, the some of the panelists had already answered it. We've gotten two that I think we can combine. Um, so the question would be, um, how can people in the majority, so heterosexual, passively or actively support the LGBTQ employees in the workplace? Thank you. <laughs> I was so excited to see that question. So, um, so it really all begins with two words. It's called cultural humility, okay? So it's a term used in the social work science and normally the, co the core concept of this term is that we need to normalize this, the saying of, I don't know what that is. Like being comfortable saying that instead of assuming things. When you are corrected, when someone has provided you feedback on the term that you used or misused, to say that, oh, I, oh, I'm so sorry, I do not know. And following up with a question of where can I learn more, right? So can I learn more about it? So there's one pitfall to that. So let us remember that we, the members of the LGBTQ plus community cannot always be expected to be the source of knowledge. So my colleague always tells me, um, she uses this phrase and is like, just because you are doesn't mean that you know. Right, so my lived experience is little t, the t, uh, you know, my small truth versus the universal big t, big truth. So I want you to be very mindful of that. So, you know, don't always ask Turbo about like, hey, what is the gay experience on this? Or what are your thoughts on this? Because it's very important. But beginning with that hu uh, cultural humility that we may not know and we might have messed up and be okay with being corrected, with being said like, oh, thank you for that. Right, so even in how we say that, if I misgender an individual, instead of saying, oh my God, I am so sorry. We are shifting the blame on somebody else because they corrected me, instead of saying, thank you for that reminder. Do you see how important and how affirming that is? You're accepting the feedback, instead of like shifting into like, I did something wrong, right? So I want you to be very mindful of that. So it is a good practice to shift the onus of educating from the person who holds a marginalized identity into the either the person or the system that holds that agency. So, or the institution or the organization to advocate for training. Like if I am the person who misused the word, I guarantee you that there's probably three or four. And that's in a small organization. So I magnify that at a national level, 
right? So when you hold that identity of power in representation or, or a superior, uh, you know, a privileged identity, I want you to be, that, that's how you can be a good ally. Like, I will be honest, I don't need more allies. I need co-conspirators. I need people who are willing to help me blow up systems of oppression, right? So that is, we need to be at the moment where we were the good allies that educated ourselves and went to the trainings and carried the conversations into our colleagues, right? Into our policies, into the scanning of how are we recruiting? How are we advertising? How are we reaching out? How are we serving? So I want you to be very mindful that allyship is, is one step, right? So it, 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 is, it is a continuum when you go for like, you know, the bystander ally to activating the allyship. So I want you to be very mindful, right? So during our planning meeting, we had a brief conversation regarding the need for a program like this. And the fact that we have to have a panel to equip students and even employers on how to deal with members of the LGBTQ plus community, that should be telling, right, of the problem is at a systemic level. So going from passively educating yourself is a great start. I will tell you um, that it is really exciting to hear these initiatives for diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus that do, do not come out um, out of the ODIAP office. Right? I know Dr. Beck Muncy is doing great work. Alana, we spend a lot of time talking about these things that we can accomplish. That is the active allyship that I need and uh, the members of my community really, really need. So hopefully I answer, but basic, the basic question, how can you be a good ally? Education and activating that education into action. Thank you, Turbo. Is there anybody else I'd like to pitch in? All right, that was an awkward silence. We'll move it on. Uh, another question that we have is from a future counselor. It's similar, but slightly different slant. What is the best way to help my future LGBTQ plus clients advocate for themselves in the workplace, especially when they are struggling with discrimination and feel unsafe? Well, I feel like that's kind of a question aimed at me, but, um, and Turbo, you did an amazing job explaining. I don't think, any, I don't know, I couldn't have added to your explanation of that. So, um, but I, I do think that one, when we're looking at individual clients, there's a lot going on. So this is kind of a complex question because I need to know specifics of what is happening at that environment. And I think the first thing is, as a counselor, our job is to listen. And so to really have a space where our clients can share this information and to not discredit this information, I think that, you know, there we want to, you know, believe our client and what they're experiencing. And that is their experience at that work environment. And so we want to hold space and help them process through those feelings that are associated with that. Um, and then, you know, looking at helping our clients find where their policies are and giving them some, you know, helping them with some suggestions and asking them what they want to do. They may not want to do anything and we got to respect that as well. Um, and so, and it may not be a safe space for them to um, continue working in that. And that might be a really real reality as well. And so, um, again, it, you know, and in counseling, you know, we're always about driven about what the client wants and what the client feels is best for their life. And so um, even though I, that's a really complex question, just because I don't know the specifics, but um, I think one giving space for them to discuss their feelings surrounding the discrimination and feeling unsafe, then seeing, you know, what they want to do about it and helping them formulate an action plan, just like you know, we were talking about that we also create action plans for our, our clients as well um, and then being a part of that process. Okay, thank you, Dr. Muncy. I think you hit that on the head. Uh, let's see here. We have another one that came in slightly different slant again, um, kind of back to the first question. What are typical faux pas that happen in the workplace that may seem normal to those in the majority or heteros? but create an awkward environment for the LGBTQ population. It could be a free for all. Anyone? I think um, like if I had to speak to that, I would say, and, and not even just in the work environment, but I, I would take that and, and spread it out just in like in life. Um, 
like <laughs> easily put like don't speak out of turn like um don't out people don't um like i see people you know and and, and i'll say like to to our fabulous gay males you know who are a little more flamboyant things like that and people you know you'll hear somebody say oh he's gay you know he's like that or they they diminish something and pin it all on someone's sexuality um don't do that or and definitely don't out people <laughs> like it's not it's not your story to tell so i will always say you know like just um i, I don't remember who said it earlier but you know let people i think it was dr munty you know if i tell if, if we tell one person something about us that doesn't give you the right to go and tell everybody else like it's our story to tell um individually so you know just be mindful of just kind of the faux, like as you call it faux pause of you know blaming everything on someone's sexuality how they act on their sexuality because we're not the LGBTQ plus community, we're not just that. You know, I tell people all the time and, 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 you know, I'm not just gay, I'm not just black, I'm not just female. Like I am so multifaceted. Those are only very, very small parts of me. So when people only see that about you, you know, it's really heartening or disheartening because you're like, I'm so much more than that. Um, and then just kind of finally close on that. It's like, I know some of the things for me is like, don't be like, Oh yeah, I have a gay friend. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, not who it's not the only thing that we are. So I think just be mindful and treat everybody just like a person, you know. Um, we're we're so many things. So don't always just focus on that one thing you now know. Thank you, Janice. That was that was spot on as well. Uh, anybody else want to jump in? really quickly i think that if you google cis normativism you're gonna find a lot of those behaviors that um when it's i consider it a faux pas it's something that's just like kind of a constant practice and it tends to be just dismissed i was like well i didn't mean it that way when you commit a faux pas it is a microaggression or a macroaggression depending on the level and the severity because guess what it is not just you who did that more than likely because of that behavior, someone else has done that multiple times. So be very mindful when someone offers you feedback or calls you in or calls you out for having said something out of turn, uh, for saying something that is considered offensive or discontinued term um, terminology, just say, thank you. I appreciate that. As simple as that, process your feelings because sometimes you're like, I did not mean it. And you want to test your debating skills at that moment. It's not about you. It is about saying that, okay, thank you. Let me research, let me, thank you for that. As simple as that. So it's a good way to correct just that cultural humility. <laughs> Embrace that. It's hard, it's painful, but you can do it. I, I guarantee you. We have Laura, time for one about, more question. Yeah, one I bet you're about question. to turn us off. Um, I just to that, the cultural humility and the, the concept of if we're called out to uh, and corrected, the immediate response for most Southerners is, oh, I'm so sorry. And so I can see where that, I say most Southerners, maybe maybe lots of people, um, regardless of geographic location, but I could definitely see where that, that may cause some unintended friction, but learning about this is very important. Uh, one last question. Oh, there's a couple more. Let's see here. I think that the this one would this one's slightly different. Um, should I be open about myself in an interview? And I think we've talked about this and um, gauged about some resources that um, students, graduates, employees, future employees should look to on the website. But this one is specifically in the interview and how how to manage and maybe test that environment to. Uh, discern if they're able to be safe in that moment. I can touch on that quickly and certainly welcome my colleagues to jump in as well. But um, to me, again, I mentioned it before, but yes, um, you should be yourself in an interview process. Again, tactfully, we we all you know speak about kind of our personal lives tactfully in the interview process because hopefully you're really focusing on your experience and your competencies in order to perform that that position to the fullest. Um, so 
you know, in that regard, you know, when you're practicing your 60 to 90 second elevator pitch, um, you know, you really want to focus on those things. But again, strategically in an interview, I ask those things now, even when I'm, I've been with enterprise for 16 years, but when I've interviewed in other, I've moved four times with the company. When I interview in other groups, I always say, one of my first questions is tell me about your diversity, equity, and inclusion policies and practices and some of your, this active steps that you're taking right now to include our employees in whatever group it is that I'm interviewing for, because I'm that passionate about it. And if my interests and their interests don't align, we're not going to be a good fit. And so I, I say that, and I, I love when an employee or a future employee sits in front of me and says, oh, can you tell me about your benefits? And then I kind of walk them through high level, and then they say, oh, okay. And then they self-disclose, my wife or my spouse or my partner. Um, then I know that that's important to them, and then I can speak to it further. Um, and I think it was Turbo said, like, an employer then will, like, sit up and be like, oh, my gosh, let me tell you more. So that was totally me. Um, and so then, you know, I really tried to, to make sure that they feel they can understand that they will be valued at my organization. I would never want a, a candidate to stand up and walk out and feel unsure. And so that's why I say for your benefit, for you to be able to at least interview process, it will allow us as an employer to share with you what might be very valuable to you. Um, and also if you do, do kind of disclose it, um, to us and you don't get the reaction that you're looking for, then it is better off that you don't start a relationship with that organization because you wouldn't be happy long term and you wouldn't be your whole self. So um, to me, I, I love that and I welcome it. Um, and I think all of recruiters at Enterprise do and for most large organizations. Um, if we have a second though, when we were preparing for this, Dr. Muncie mentioned um, something that I thought was really valuable about maybe interviewing at not such large organizations in more rural areas and some ways to navigate that. So I'd like to turn it over to him. Oh, well, I don't remember what I said, <laughs> um, but I think, I think it is important where, you know, you're looking at where you're going to be employed as well. And if people that you're going through the job interview are people, a part of the community that you're going to run into as well. So you may not feel very safe to come out. And again, I always feel like this is, um, is a really personal decision. And this is one that you need to decide if you feel comfortable sharing this information um, and I know for uh, some of us, you know, specifically with the counseling field, I share that information about myself because if, you know, that's part of our ethical code as counselors is to be open and, and accepting and working with anyone. And so if I get a adverse reaction to counselors, when I interview with counselors, I'm like, oh man, this is definitely not the place for me. But I'm also in a space that I feel privileged that I'm allowed to be who I am in a, and out and authentic in my world. Um, but I know that's not the case for everybody else. And so, um, but I do think it is important to, you know, deciding if you're going to come out as well as it is, is this company really a part of the community? What, it, what is the community saying about this company and or this organization? And um, do I, do I have other people, a part of this community that are working there? What are they saying? Like, it's okay. You know, we use our resources and I, I think it's really important to continue that. Um, and I really like the concept of looking at their social media accounts. What are they saying surrounding issues or what are they not saying is also very important as well um, on those kinds of platforms too. If I could just offer one last testament. Uh, I was on a, a diversity webinar learning as a learner and um, a, a gentleman piped in that he was interviewing in a very stereotypical male industry and a, a, a gay a gay male man and he well that would be the same my apologies anyway uh, when he was in the interview he questioned whether or not he should disclose that information in the interview and then decided uh, to just go ahead and ask was because he had done the research and he couldn't find any of that information that that you have been talking about um, and through the course of the interview, made it uh, made it aware to the interviewer that he was a gay man and has was married. And what does your company do to support that? And the interviewer stopped and said, "Well, 
currently we don't do much, but come on board and teach us. And so that's not, that's not always the predict, that's not always the predicted answer. And um, sometimes um, I'm hoping that that happens more than, more than not. Uh, but I would say, uh, I would encourage you to push through if you can, um, and maybe the, the, the goodness will see, keep coming out. Just really, really, I know we're running out of time, but it's, it is something important to think about when all of us in this audience are the person in power, right? To begin making sure that we have an environment for our future employees. Right, so all that learning. Um, so one, don't rely on that one individual to come and teach us because you will set him up for a failure because he may be just one against 30, right? So it is absolutely true. It is the infiltrate the system little by little, right? But all of us who are in this call who have attended this webinar is like also, what is your responsibility in advancing equity, right? So it is so important that you can be able to say that you are a proud ally, that you have the the training, the knowledge, the understanding, the empathy for insert marginalized identity, right? Um, so it is not always like, yeah, come fix the company because the reality is like, if that would have been possible, it would have been fixed. Um, that is very important. So I just wanted to like chime in on that, but it's true. So it is everyone's responsibility to ensure that we have an equitable environment. So that'll be you in the future too. Oh my gosh, this has been just flown by. And, you know, um, initially I talked to Dr. Muncie about doing this event. And Dr. Muncie said, I could just talk about this for hours and hours. And here we are going slightly over our hour. So I want to remind you that um, there were resource, resources posted in the chat. Um, we might not have gotten to address all questions, but, you know, we certainly have tried in this um, event has been recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel or on the Career Services website. It will take us a few days to get to that, but eventually it will be so that other students who miss this event, if you say, oh, I, we had this great event and oh, I'm sorry I missed it, they will be able to view it. So, um, and our, I want to mention, you know, our Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and International Programs. There are lots of resources on their website as well. We want to especially thank our partner, Enterprise, and um, we're just so happy that you um, have been able to join us. They are um, putting a plug in for Enterprise. They are doing interviews tomorrow and Thursday. I believe Alana put something in the chat. You can contact um, Candice Torito at Torito, that's T-E-R-R-I-T-O at tarleton.edu, or just call our career services office and we will get you connected if you would like to interview with Enterprise. Um, but again, thank you all of the panelists um, for joining us and um, thank you Enterprise so much. Everyone have a wonderful evening and go out and do your best to be inclusive and practice equity. We all need to help others understand and learn. Thank you. Thank you. Bye folks.